It was literally, literally only a matter of time before people started talking their bullshit on the Yakuza franchise. It was only a matter of time. It's gone from being really popular in Japan to just being like a massive sensational, like whatever you want to call it. Yakuza's become super, super popular. And whilst that's a good thing for the longevity of the franchise, it's also just a bad thing because stuff like this happens. When gamers from different regions get their grubby hands on your art and think they know what's best for it. They think they know how they're going to save the franchise. Yakuza examines masculinity with care but leaves women behind. The women of Yakuza don't enjoy the same agency as the men. The Lord in heaven, these people never, ever give it a rest. Sam, Greece, or whatever your name is. I went onto your Twitter before reading this to get a look at you, but all I found was this nonsense. Someone made a video teardown of my Polygon piece where they said, I obviously hate the Yakuza franchise and nothing's ever good enough for games media. Achievement unlocked, I guess. But also, if you're going to make a video about an article, at least read it first. I love those games. So I'm going to read your article from top to bottom. I haven't read it yet, but it's not off to a great start. I'm going to be honest with you. But if you're saying that this person didn't even bother to give you the time of day to read your article that you wrote over and I'm sure you think is correct or you're passionate about, then I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt since you claim to love the Yakuza franchise. But you know, I showed it to my girlfriend and I showed it to a couple of my female friends and instantly all of these people scoffed at it pretty hard. So you better have some half decent points. You better have context. You better have everything to make a concise argument but somehow I sincerely doubt that. Best thing is when people say you clearly don't like this thing when it's about some of their favorite stuff. Love that. It's wild. I never ask for a female main character in this piece and everyone's just being like SJW want Yakuza to not be about men. I don't know I think I did a good job but it's hard when things get willfully misrepresented like that. I like that it's a positive story about men. It's special. It's the classic fanboy defense of if you don't love things unconditionally you actually hate it because criticism especially thematic criticism of things you like is not allowed. It's all just gatekeeping nonsense. I love it when people tell me I hate football as if someone who hates football would spend eight years of his life devoting most of his free time to to it. Okay, well good to know that echo chambers have been set up, but anyway, let's go ahead and see if Sam has anything of intelligence to say. In a 2019 interview with OtterQuest, Yakuza series creator Toshihiro Nagoshi was asked about his intended audience for the games. He responded simply that the games are stories about men written by men, primarily for an audience of men. But he went on, because we tried to ignore both younger and female audiences, we inherently captivated their interest in the contents of the game. You gotta love the Japanese games industry. They just don't care what other people have to say and I respect it. The thing is, I could make a game with an idea in mind for who it's supposed to be for. And if you don't like it, then jog on and play something else. There are so many games out there to play. You really don't need to be playing my one if you don't like something in it. But you can't do that in the West. Oh no, don't ever think about doing that over here or in America. The idea of a game being made for men may as well be an act of war at this point. But I guarantee you, you saying you're making a game for women and suddenly you're stunning and brave. Can't go both ways down these bits because men are bad and down with the patriarchy and all that stuff. But I ain't saying that's what Sam is saying. Just to be clear, I'm not saying that's what Sam is saying. Not yet anyway. We're not there yet in the article. But he makes a great point here in this statement. The reason that so many women love these games is because of how they are, how they are right now. Why would you endeavor to change it if it's serving those people, which in turn serves everyone. I don't know, maybe Sam will let us know why in a minute. Even as he was faced with a growing fan base of teenagers and adult women, both in Japan and internationally, Nagoshi said he wanted to resist catering to those audiences because he felt like it would jeopardize the franchise's original vision, the one that had brought in those fans in the first place. Good. Do what you love and create the games that you love and the games that you want. The right people will show up for them and that's why people love the Yakuza games. Don't go changing for wet blankets or people that feel like they're being excluded. Imagine picking up a game and feeling left out like... <laughs> I, I don't know, like, I, I just don't know what goes through some people's heads sometimes. That instinct may seem somewhat understandable at first, but it's off the mark. Oh, Jesus. The Yakuza games have likely found a diverse and growing audience because of the way the franchise examines masculinity, especially toxic masculinity, but a commentary on masculinity, toxic or otherwise, must also necessarily be a commentary on femininity, and indeed the full breadth of the gender spectrum at large in order to be complete. This is where the Yakuza franchise fails. Oh, God. And so it begins. It didn't take long. We're not even five minutes into this yet. This is where the Yakuza franchise fails. Really, Sam? In order to be complete, why does it need to be for the full breadth of the gender spectrum at large when it's a game made for men? I don't get it. 
I don't get it. Maybe you'll explain it to me in a bit, but right now I'm just not understanding where you're going with this. These games don't exist in a vacuum. They may tell stories by, about, and designed for men, but that doesn't excuse the fact that the same progressive, empathetic attitude the series takes with regards to its male characters doesn't extend to its female ones. Yeah, because it's a game for men, about men. That's why it doesn't extend to women. I'm confused, like how did you reference that point and also miss that point in the same couple of paragraphs? How did you do that? The fact that the franchise both succeeds and fails in its discussion of gender has invited a lot of feminist analysis that attempts to make sense of all of these apparent contradictions. Rina, an artist and Yakuza fan, cited the 2019 interview of Nagoshi as evidence of a possible reason why the franchise treats its male and female characters so differently. She told Polygon that while it's commendable that the series developers are willing to implement healthy and at times even subversive amounts of masculinity in their male protagonists by working in positive traits they are less willing to listen to women's voices in terms of handling female characters with agency instead of just respectfully. Yeah, because it's a game designed by men for men. That's why, I don't get it. How has this guy raised that point and also pretended like Nagoshi didn't just say that it's for men about men? Of course they are less willing to listen to women's voices. It's a man telling the story. Why? What, what am I even reading right now? What is this guy talking about? Nagoshi was so clear in the beginning. It is designed by men for men. Like that is, that is as far as that should have gone. Yakuza includes compelling female characters who aren't just there as eye candy or to serve as narrative crutches to further a male protagonist story. But at the same time, the games deny these female characters the agency afforded to male characters. Women in the franchise are largely unable to achieve their own goals through their own actions, relying instead on the protagonist to help them first. This means that despite its best efforts, the Yakuza franchise's discussion of toxic masculinity are necessarily incomplete. I feel like every single paragraph I read from Sam is going to be met with the same response. Women in the franchise are unable to achieve their own goals through their own actions because the story is about men for men. What is this guy not getting? The guy wants the men doing all the heavy lifting. The people that made this game want the men doing all the heavy lifting because it's a story about them and their character development and not the women. What are you not understanding about that? Kazuma Kiryu is the Yakuza franchise's narrative lens. From the outside, Sega's Yakuza franchise seems to be offering players the standard male power fantasy found in so many other games. As Nagoshi said, these are stories about men written by men, full of action movie machismo worth of any Schwarzenegger flick. From the inside, however, the Yakuza games deliver a forceful, empathetic repudiation of toxic masculinity that is unique in gaming. The Yakuza franchise chooses to frame its discussion of toxic masculinity through contrasting its main point of view character with its villains setting a positive expression of masculinity against a toxic one. The stand-in for positive masculinity here is series protagonist Kiryu, an ageless, legendary badass with washboard abs and an eggshell white suit. This whole talk of toxic masculinity is so stupid. It's bad people doing bad things. The game is about a criminal underworld. That's it. If women were doing it, it's not toxic femininity, it's a female Yakuza doing what Yakuza's do. At first blush, Kiryu seems to fit all the stereotypes of a male main character. He's incredibly strong, both mentally and physically, and he's conventionally attractive. This plays into the standard male power fantasy in gaming. He plays a perfect, sexy man who has complete power and control. Scott Stritcher, the main in charge of localizing the games for a Western audience, described Kiryu to Gamer Sutra as a character who represents self-determination in the face of a Japanese culture that can sometimes devalue individualism. And though that the picture of heroism and masculinity reads differently overseas, in the United States it's easy to fit Kiryu alongside an endless stream of supermen able to affect change in the world around them. It's really not, at least not to people with a working brain. At no point did I think Kiryu fit the description of the endless stream of other male characters in the West that appear strong. Probably because I let the story progress beyond 30 minutes before opening my mouth. Over time, however, it becomes clear that this isn't all there is to Kiryu. Kiryu spends time on both sides of the law, alternating between acting as a member of the Yakuza and working with police to take down particularly evil people in the city of Kamurocho. The Dragon of Dojima, as they call him, is a hero, helping people with their problems and taking responsibility for keeping the city safe, even though he's involved with organized crime. Throughout both side missions and main story of the games, you're encouraged to look at Kamurocho through Kiryu's eyes. Eyes. He helps women with their mundane problems as well as some problems that are decidedly not mundane. As much as he helps men with
of theirs and at least in the remastered game he does not sexualize the women he helps out. Even in the side missions that lead to chances for Kiryu to pursue a romantic interest, Kiryu never makes the first move, instead always waiting for the person in question to express romantic intent first, then responding. This respect however is severely undercut by the fact that the Yakuza games also allow you to date upward of 5 people at once, without informing them and without consequence. Don't people date multiple people at once without telling them in real life? Like you may think it's wrong to do. I do too. I wouldn't date multiple people at once. But it's a game about a man in the criminal underworld. Did you expect him to live a complete clean cookie cutter life? Again, this is the world that they've built for the Yakuza franchise and it makes complete sense within that world. I suppose we should just pretend that they're not gangsters though. Let's just pretend they're not gangsters. Like this guy man. Kiryu does not judge people in the sex work industry either. The most notable example of this is in the non-judgmental way he treats brothel worker Akemi in Yakuza Kiwami. But his respect is also visible in the way he chats with cam girls in Yakuza 6, following the flow of conversation that's dictated by the model and never being obscene, or at least never being obscene in a way that doesn't match the tone that the model has already set. Women in the Yakuza series aren't just there to make Kiryu look like a cool, empathetic, helpful, attractive and nuanced guy. However, they also have their own stories, desires and complaints. They won't mince words about being surrounded by sexism, about feeling forced into stereotypical hostess job or about the unique pressures of being a woman in Japan. The women here are not set dressing, but although they have their own well written personal stories, they also all need the player character, whether it's Kiryu, Majima or anybody else, to intervene in order to achieve their goals in ways that the male characters don't. Andy, an artist who is also a big fan of the Yakuza series, summed it up this way when Polygon asked them to weigh in on the matter. Yeah, that's because the story is about male characters. I really don't think you're getting that, Sam. It's not about the female characters, their side story or their character development. It's about the male characters, their stories and their development. And whilst you can watch the female characters develop and feel satisfied with their stories, ultimately, their stories are just there to further the stories of the male characters. It is what it is. If you don't like it, just jog on. Female characters in the Yakuza franchise tend to lack agency or sometimes even punished for their willingness to make their own decisions or acting on their own interests. Often played for one game only before some writing tool forces them out of the picture for the next. Their jobs often fall under only a few options, hostess, idol or plot relevant love interest, all of which serve to enrich the roles of our male heroes. None of it is to say they are bad characters nor is it to say Yakuza has not been getting better, but if the series truly intends to impact the game world with its themes, it still has a few milestones to catch up in terms of treatment of their female characters. I hate to break it to you Sam, but Yakuza has already impacted the gaming world and as long as RGG Studios continue doing what they're doing and bringing the interesting and crazy stories of Yakuza to the forefront, it's gonna be fine. Don't worry about the Yakuza franchise. This guy is talking about a Japanese criminal underworld as if it should look like middle America, but yeah, all of their roles serve to enrich the roles of the male characters because it's a game about male heroes. This is textbook white knighting at its absolute best. Part of this could be attributed to the fact that there are barely any women represented in the franchise's depiction of the Yakuza. Indeed, the vast majority of the male civilians Kiryu helps out also need his help to achieve their goals as well. True self-determination in the series is reserved almost exclusively for people who are in some way connected with organized crime. This puts Kiryu in a unique place narratively as he is portrayed both as a civilian and as a member of the Yakuza. Since he exists in both worlds, simultaneously, he is one of the only characters in the game to be blessed with both self-determination and the ability to have an emotional arc. And indeed throughout the series, Kiryu is consistently shown as one of the only member of the Yakuza who is in touch with himself emotionally. This characterization surfaces in many different ways both subtle and overt. Setting aside the character that the vast majority of the Yakuza franchise side missions task, Kiryu with selflessly helping people with their problems, Kiryu is one of the few protagonists in gaming who actually cries when tragic events occur. Okay, that's first First of all, a bag of lies. There are a lot of characters in this game that are in touch with themselves emotionally besides Kiryu. It's making me question if this guy's actually played any of the games properly. And now I'm thinking that he's probably only played Yakuza 0 and even then, this would still be a lie. Just because the spotlight is not on the other male characters as much as Kiryu, it doesn't mean that they're not in touch with their emotional side and I don't understand how you didn't pick up on that. It just means that not as much time is spent on getting to know them as we do Kiryu, but you definitely get to see the emotional side of them. Oda, 
Tachibana, Majima, Kazuma, Ryuji, just to name a few. His emotional range doesn't just stop at righteous sadness though. He's a badass short, but that doesn't stop him from making a fool of himself on the dance floor. It doesn't prevent him from belting out a karaoke classic while tearfully reminiscing about his childhood and an orphanage, or about the good times shared with his former best friend turned bitter enemy. It certainly doesn't stop him from getting peed on whilst taking care of a baby. Kiryu doesn't see any of this as an embarrassing or demeaning. He's not ashamed of expressing himself through dancing or singing, and when a baby pees on him, his nonchalant reaction makes it clear that he's not mad at the baby or even embarrassed that his friends saw him get peed on. Despite the fact that singing, dancing and childcare are all actions that require putting one's emotions on display and showing vulnerability, Kiryu performs all of these acts with incredible confidence. Okay, first of all, doing most things is showing your emotion in some capacity. Secondly, I think this guy missed the comedy aspect of, of uh, Yakuza completely. I think the whole comedy aspect went completely over this guy's head. And other people get on the dance floor and take part in karaoke segments as well, but we'll pretend they don't. Let's just pretend that Kiryu is the only one that does that. It bears mentioning at this point that in the original non-remastered games, Kiryu was not always this understanding and kind. Before Yakuza 3 was remastered and released internationally, its developers, at the request of series creators including Negoshi, removed a group of transphobic side missions featuring Kiryu repeatedly misgendering a gender variant character who also embodied several harmful stereotypes about trans people such as behaving in a sexually predatory way. Isn't there a side mission in Yakuza 0 or Kiwami 1 where Kiryu calls a trans person a man instead of a woman and then goes on to agree to beat up said person. Something along them lines I can't really remember it's been a little while. There's definitely another one in Kiwami where Kiryu calls a trans woman a man and a trans man a woman and then proceeds to beat both of them up for tricking him. They have removed some of these missions that is true but there's still some comedy left in there and I really don't think it was done with malicious intent. In the modern and remastered Yakuza titles a lot of work has been done to characterize Kiryu as a soft, charming dad who respects and is beloved by his entire community no matter who they are. He also just happens to be a feared legend in the Japanese underworld. He's vulnerable in a way that few western male protagonists are allowed to be and he's also representative of a slowly changing attitude towards masculinity in Japan. The Sugata Research Institute wrote in 2015 that over time it has not only become more acceptable for Japanese men to embrace more traditionally feminine behaviours and attitudes but that this emotional vulnerability is also being viewed as a sign of bravery. This all ties into the expression of strong positive masculinity that has come to define Kiryu's character in current generation titles and remasters. There's nothing wrong with being soft but also being a badass and it doesn't make you any less of a man or a badass to be a bit of a softie at times. I don't think anyone was under that illusion. Any complete functioning person anyway. Atlas Localization director Sam Mullen speaking with Game Informer discussed the difficulties in translating this type of positive masculinity for different audiences, pointing specifically to a series of quests in Yakuza Kirami where Kiryu has the opportunity to date a woman who had described herself as a lesbian. I remember having a lot of discussions with Scott about how to approach that storyline. The way her story results in Japanese, if translated straight, comes off as like, well you just never met a real man, kind of feel to it. But I don't think that's the intention they were going for, that's just the way it comes across in English. So I do remember there being this light feeling of needing to change the language because that's not the point here. The localization staff has clearly worked hard to make sure Kiryu's embodiment of positive masculinity translates across cultures and that's not just by design. It's vital to the franchise because the antagonists in the Yakuza series by and large represent toxic masculinity. I think the antagonists portray what most antagonists do, doing shitty things to good people, whether they're male or female. But let's keep throwing this toxic masculinity thing around because it's exclusive to men to do bad things. Toxic masculinity is the real villain in the Yakuza series. Oh god, he just doesn't stop, does he? It just doesn't stop. This whole article has been dribbled so far. Beginning with the three Dojima clan lieutenants in Yakuza, Yakuza 0, all the way through to enemies of Yakuza 6, Kiryu faces off with male characters who have been warped by ambition, abuse or deep emotional repression. This warping causes them to violently and randomly lash out other men to emotionally and physically abuse women and to betray trusted friends. Every game in the Yakuza franchise brings these destructive, toxic expressions of machismo into uncomfortable, clear focus. And while these types of violence do not represent the entirety of the behaviours and attitudes that make up toxic masculinity as a whole, the fact that the franchise has acknowledges toxic masculinity is not just something that exists but as something that ruins lives and needs to be actively fought against is rare in AAA gaming, especially in an open world action game where you play as a criminal. Sam, the hero needs a good villain to bounce off. So the villain is going to do villain shit so the hero can do hero shit. It's a black and white situation. Are the motivations between the series villains different? Yes, obviously. 
They have to keep doing different things to keep the story interesting, which is what Yakuza has been so great at doing so far. If this was a game that focused on women that were doing the exact same things as the men in this game, would you call it feminine toxicity or shitty behaviour in general? This isn't behaviour that is exclusive to men. These just happen to be men in positions of power in a criminal underworld and a few people are getting caught in the crosshairs. It's not a hard concept to grasp. The conflict between positive and toxic masculinity is, in many ways, the heart of the Yakuza franchise and it's exemplified in the way Kazuma Kiryu's relationship changes with his best friend and sworn Yakuza brother Akira Nishikiyama across Yakuza 0 and Yakuza Kiwami. In Yakuza 0, a prequel title that serves to tell the story of how Kiryu joined the Yakuza in the first place, Nishiki is portrayed as a warm and loving if impulsive and emotional character. He and Kiryu both grew up in the same orphanage raised by the same surrogate father, meaning they are not only sworn brothers in the Yakuza but also for all intents and purposes familial brothers as well. During the event of Yakuza Kiwami however, Nishiki changes, an inferiority complex born from being unfavourably compared with Kiryu by higher ups in the Yakuza, combined with a heartbreaking series of personal tragedies culminating in the death of his sister, caused Nishiki to choose to become cold and unfeeling instead of grappling with his own intense pain and sadness. He spends the duration of the game trying to prove himself by killing Kiryu, the only way he feels he can prove his value to the world at large. Did anybody happen to watch the new Wonder Woman trailer by the way? In that trailer you see Cheetah as she was before she felt an inferiority complex to Diana and she seems hell-bent on getting power and getting everything that Diana has and prove herself as the apex predator. By doing what? by killing Diana. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like Nishiki to you? Oh, because it's women, it's not feminine toxicity. I'm looking forward to your article on that one, Sam, but I'm anticipating something more along the lines of stunning and brave, because you know, white knights have got a white knight. Though other antagonists in the series don't always depict such a clear representation of how horrifically toxic masculinity can change a person, they are all warped in their own ways as well. This stretches across Kiryu's story from the violent rage and machismo of Yakuza Zero's antagonist Kuze, who insists on battling Kiryu no matter how broken his body is, to the emotionless cruelty of Yakuza 6 antagonist Iwami, a man who destroys his own family in order to achieve his own goals. The lesson is clear, toxic masculinity destroys everything it touches but in the end it can itself be defeated by having a healthy relationship with your own emotions, one that enables you to take righteous brave action to protect what you believe in. In the world of Yakuza however that action is reserved for men alone. This Sam guy is actually a joker. Those are human traits that spread across all people no matter what gender. You give someone the right motivation and set of circumstances and they'll go dark and they'll be consumed by the need to see something through to the end no matter what, no matter how many people get hurt in the process. It's not a trait that is exclusive to men and so throwing around this toxic masculinity phrase all the time just seems tired, lazy and clickbaity. Kuze for example was a boxer before he was a Yakuza and anyone that knows anything about martial artists know that they will fight until their last breath. They will fight until you knock them out or kill them. Justin Gagey, the interim champion to Khabib's championship, has gone on record and said he would rather perish in the octagon than walk away like a coward. Tiago Santos fought against John Jones, arguably the greatest martial artist to ever live, with a torn ACL for an entire fight. The fight went from beginning to end and he fought on basically one leg and despite his leg being shattered, he continued to fight and he continued to throw kicks. That is what a fighter is willing to do. That sentiment translates over to the women in combat sports as well. You go and watch any female boxing match or any female UFC match, you'll see the exact same thing. It's something fighters do and it's respectable. It takes a level of balls that I understand you may never understand. What Kuze did is what any other martial artist would do. He was defeated by a younger man and he wanted to win by any means necessary, whether his body was broken or not. Not to mention he is part of a criminal underworld and losing to Kiryu cost him a pinky and even though he said he didn't care about the pinky, the loss is what upset him and he doesn't care about all those titles, he wanted to fight because he's a martial artist. So yeah, maybe a bit of context before you write dribble like that. The women of Yakuza are stuck, my lord in heaven, someone take this man's keyboard away from him. Kel Hutner, a Yakuza fan and writer for No Escape, brought up Yakuza 0 when asked for their thoughts on how the Yakuza franchise deals with gender and specifically highlighted the character of Makoto Makimura, a woman who has been blinded because of horrific abuse and who holds the deeds to a very important piece of land. In the game, Makoto makes a power play when she demands the murder of three ruthless Yakuza lieutenants in exchange for the deed. Once Makoto makes this demand, she immediately gets shot by a hitman. Kel translates this with a scene earlier in the game. when a 
male character Tachibana makes a similar request to the same man, the release of Kiryu in exchange for 1 billion yen, Tachibana walks out unscathed. Yeah, okay, first of all, this is a lie again, and slightly different situation then. This is what makes me think he didn't play the Yakuza games and he went on Wikipedia and found answers. So, Makoto stood before three lieutenants she was calling for the murder of in exchange for the deed. She was standing in front of the three guys she was asking to be killed. Tachibana stood before the chairman of the Tojo clan, someone who has much more diplomatic enthusiasm and is willing to listen. She also stood on her own before the very men she was asking to be off. Let's just make that clear. Whilst Tachibana stood before them with Oda and Kiryu by his side. Not only that, but even though the chairman of the Tojo clan agreed to let Kiryu go because he received the 1 billion yen which would benefit them costing no life to his men he didn't without unleashing the entire tojo estate on oda tachibana and kiryu there was no guarantee they'd be able to get out with their lives against hundreds of gangsters wielding guns swords and their own brand of martial arts makoto does not know how to fight she is blind and she is calling out very very dangerous men to their face nice try but try again Kel told Polygon that the implication here is that either because Makoto is a woman or more charitably because she's not part of the Yakuza world, her demand of blood for blood was so laughably unreasonable that negotiations just didn't need to happen at all. In Yakuza 0, Makoto's lack of agency is so palpable that she herself recognises it after being shot, telling Kiryu and Majima point blank that she hates that they have to be there to move her narrative forward. That sentiment is shared by many Yakuza fans who wish that Makoto were more in control of her own destiny. Is it shared by many Yakuza fans why are you just saying that I have never seen that before Shibasawa said in the Yakuza world they write in other people's blood they write using other people's blood it's a world where only the strong survive and the weak don't get a say the weak don't even get to live it's not to say that women are weak because in Yakuza Kiwami 2 Dojima's wife the wife of the recently deceased Dojima from Kiwami 1 heads up the Tojo clan as its acting chairman for a time and is shown respect by her subordinates which all happen to be male it's just in that instance Makoto was very fragile, a very very fragile character who couldn't do much on her own. She's just a girl that happened to be in the possession of a very important set of deeds that some very powerful and dangerous criminals wanted. What exactly would you have had her do in that situation? I'd love to hear how Makoto could have gone about that in front of four dangerous Yakuza veterans that all gave Majima and Kiryu a serious run for their money at the end of Yakuza 0. I'm not even going to talk about Sayama but yeah this ain't about women being weak and stuck. It made sense in the context of that part of the narrative and you guys have no idea, no idea what you're talking about Polygon, especially you Sam. If you were in charge of this series, it would have gone to shit in an instant. And the fact that Makoto even made those negotiations, yeah you can argue it was stupid, it was dumb. But she's just some regular girl, she's not going to make coherent decisions. Her brother was just murdered, she's acting illogically because she's being emotional. It's very 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 easy to understand, it makes sense in the context of the world. This theme continues with Haruka, who was the franchise only playable female character prior to the release of Lacusa Like a Dragon. Despite her intelligence, her ambitions, her strength and her talent, she spends the majority of the franchise waiting on approval from men to continue along her narrative arc. She does achieve her dream of becoming a pop star through her own blood, sweat and tears, yes, but you're still mostly playing as Kiryu when you're breaking down the narrative barriers that prevented her from working towards goal in the first place. In the few moments of self-determination that she has when she's playable, Kiryu's trusted male friend Akiyama is always around to provide narrative momentum. Well, I mean, Haruka was a child for a lot of the series surrounded by powerful, dangerous men. You know what, this is so laughably stupid. I don't even know if it's worth continuing, but I said I would read the whole article, so let's just keep reading, but oh my god, this is mind-numbingly bad. It's impossible to fully determine whether this is because the games themselves are making a subversive point about sexism in Japan, or whether that is overly charitable reading of a game franchise that has consistently struggled to give its female characters agency. The fact that the Yakuza series views masculinity with such a subversive, empathetic tone makes its failings with regards to its female characters seem worse in contrast. Even if those failings are far from unique in gaming at large, Kiryu seems to treat women with more respect than the game itself does. He respects sex workers and he never harasses hostesses. While the game's storyline may deny its female characters agency, Kiryu encourages women to fight back against sexism, break out of abusive relationships and strive for self-determination in any way they can. There's also evidence that the folks who work on these games have their hearts in the right place despite past missteps. It's not failing female characters because it doesn't make the games too fail for them. 
The criteria is to make the games for the men who enjoy them and those boxes have been ticked and checked off. Kiryu encourages women to fight back because he's a good person and that's why he's the protagonist and the antagonist does the opposite because they're antagonists. In a game about the criminal underworld, did you really expect criminal men to be treating women like princesses? Why don't you just go play Animal Crossing? I think you've got the wrong game here. The path forward for the Yakuza franchise on these issues is up in the air at this point, especially since the series has essentially wrapped up the story of Kazuma Kiryu, opting instead for an ensemble cast of protagonist in Yakuza Like a Dragon. Time will tell whether or not their narratives will continue to champion Kiryu's trademark positive masculinity, but given the fact that the recent Yakuza spin-off Judgment did so, that seems to be a safe bet. Having said that, the removal of a hero like Kazuma Kiryu from Yakuza's overarching narrative means that he won't be there to spur women's stories forward. Hopefully this means that the women of Yakuza will for once be able to do it themselves. The things you said in this article aren't issues. I think you've missed the point of these games and I think you're asking them to do things that will compromise the integrity and the storytelling of the franchise. I guarantee you, if they went the direction you were asking them to, the game sales will just tank. They'll tank, they'll plummet. And now I've read over all your points. I could have used more things as a reference to show why your points are founded in nonsense, but I think the point has been made here. So yeah, nothing's good enough for games media these days. I've read this dribble from top to bottom with several people of the opposite gender and I think you just did it for clickbait. And don't try to say some nonsense since like this is the classic case of fanboys hating on anything that isn't unconditional loyalty to the series that they love because I refuted all your points clearly and concisely but what do you guys think about all of this let me know in the comment section below don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel I'll catch you guys next time peace